All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, I'm not going to talk long. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Kajamas, who's director at George Mason uh, Counseling, and she's going to go over a little bit about what you guys are in for as you guys move up to uh, George Mason. So. You're in for something great. <laughs> Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, before we actually get started, I just wanted to introduce you to some people from George Mason. Part of our counseling staff is here. This is Brad McAdam and Nancy Goldman. And then we have our IB coordinator. If you were here the other day, you met Kelly Brown. And then Kevin Clark is our, one of our assistant principals at the high school. So welcome. Um, today is not about courses for next year. It's not about registering for courses. It's about showing you what is required for your student to graduate <coughs> from a Virginia public high school. In this case, George Mason High School. So we're going to go over the different diploma types, and then I'm going to show you what a typical transcript looks like and will look like for your student. So in the state of Virginia, we have two basic diplomas. We have the standard diploma and the advanced diploma. This is a sample of courses that we're going to use, or to uh, courses that a student would need to gain a standard diploma. They're, the papers, by the way, that you have are these just so you can have them as a reference. Each one of these squares represents a semester of a class. So in order for your student to get a standard diploma, they are required to have a minimum of 22 credits to graduate. And this is, your students are graduating in 2019, I believe, correct? Yes. Okay. So in English, all students are required in the state of Virginia to have four years of English, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. There are different levels of courses, but we'll go over that when we, we see you next Wednesday night, January 28th. We'll be talking about the specific levels and what, it, what a course looks like. They need um, at least three years of social studies. Now, many of your students this year at Mary Ellen Henderson are taking World Civ One, and that is for high school credit. So that would count towards one of their social studies credits for high school. Again, these are minimums that are required. So if they're taking World Civ One this year, next year they could take World Civ Two, and then go on, but they're not required to. As long as we'll talk about verified credits in a minute, but they will need a verified credit in World Civ, uh, one of the World Civs. They need at least three years of math uh, at the level of Algebra One and above. And some of your students have had Algebra One, some of your students are in Algebra One, and some of your students will be taking Algebra One. So again, if they've had it or they are taking it now, that counts towards one of their math credits for high school. Science, they need at least three years of science in at least two different disciplines. And the disciplines are considered the biological, chemical, physical, and earth science. The physical science course that your students are taking this year does not count for high school credit. So I know that's a little confusing, but if they were to take a, a physical science course in high school, that would count for credit. So, so far, everything that I've said that could possibly count for high school credit might be algebra or geometry that they have in middle school and the world civ one. They're all required to have health and PE in grades 9 and 10. And there are the, sorry, for a standard diploma, students are not required take a world language or foreign language. They can take a world language or a foreign <coughs> language, but they're not required to. But they must have a fine art, a career in tech ed. They must have at least one career in tech ed course for a standard diploma. If you have older students, this might not have been the case for your students because the rules in the state of Virginia have since changed. They have to have a, a personal finance and economics, and actually that's from economics and personal finance. But they're required uh, by the state of Virginia to have this course before they graduate. And we suggest they really don't take that course before their 10th grade year. We get more out of it the older that they are. Uh, and we have multiple ways for students to take that course. They have to have at least four electives, and two of them must be sequential, such as art one, art two, theater one, theater two. Computer science, computer science, IB computer science. And they're required to have a virtual course. Some of our courses that we offer are considered virtual courses. So this is not an additional course. 
this is just saying that one course, at least one course that they take must be virtual, an online tech course. So we offer economics and personal finance in the classroom and as a hybrid learning, in a hybrid learning scenario. Both of them are considered virtual courses. So they satisfy this no matter what because they're required to take the economics and personal finance and our course satisfies the virtual course stipulation from the state. Any questions so far? Okay. How many of you do not know what a verified credit is? Okay. A verified credit means that a student takes a class, and if that class has an end of course test from the state, and in the state of Virginia they're called standards of learning, and your students have taken them or will take them, um, if they pass the class and pass the SOL or that standards of learning in May, then they get what's called a verified credit. They're verifying the credit that they got. So for a standard diploma, they're required to take a writing and a reading SOL or standard of learning, and they take that their junior year. They can't take it before then. They are required to have one social studies, one math, one science, and one of their choice. For the social studies, there are three options for taking it. It's World Civ I, World Civ II, or U.S. History. Those are the only social studies that we offer in Falls Church City that has an end of course standard of learning. For math, there are multiple options. There's Algebra I, there's Geometry, there's Algebra II. Whichever one they pass, they get the verified credit for. Science would be um, earth science, biology, and chemistry, and then whatever course that they want to verify credit for the student choice. Any que questions? Yes. How does it work then if you, you take, I'm just devil's advocate, if you, take okay. it, if you don't pass an SOL mm -hmm. in a class, say it's World Civ 1, okay. if you pass the class, with good grades, you go on to World Civ 2, or do you, is, there, is there a problem <coughs> moving ahead and then how does that affect it? That's a good question. Whether you pass the SOL or not does not prohibit you from moving to a ne the next course. But what we try and do if a student does not pass the SOL is remediate with the student and allow them to retake the SOL. It's within a time frame that the state allows us to issue the tests, but we can we can offer them multiple times to retake it. But they could go on to World Civ too. Okay, so Absolutely. In that case, though, if they don't pass the SOL, they or if they if they pass the SOL, they'll go ahead to the next class. Will they take the next SOL if the course well? offers it? If it, they'll take it anyway. Whenever they whenever it. there's a class where there is an SOL, the student will sit and take the test. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, I okay. Yes. Um, just backing up a little bit, for the virtual um, courses, is there some place we can find out which ones are offered? Uh, is there an online information? Uh, Great question. So what we'll share with you on Wednesday night, um, January 28th, when we go over the courses and whatnot, is our program of studies book. Mm -hmm. And in that, it lists our hybrid learning courses that we have at George Mason High School. Um, and I just wanted to share with you, it's not on our website yet because it's just being printed now, but this current year's program of studies book is on our website if you wanted to look at that in advance. Okay, and are some of those classes available in the summer for summer school? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. It says six verified credits, which are these SOL courses. Yes. Once you've got those six SOLs out of the way and you take out a course where there are SOLs at the end of it, you have to take those SOLs? The state says you do. The state says you have to sit for it. Because, and th this is the rationale that's been given to us. If a student takes a course and doesn't sit for the SOL, they think we're trying to pull some wool over somebody's eyes. Maybe we didn't think that they would do well on the SOL or something of that nature. So we have to justify to the state why a student is not sitting for an SOL if they're in a, a course that has one. I'm, I'm sure there are extenuating circumstances, but we would have to let the state know what. Any others before we move on? Did I leave anything out there? Okay. Sorry, same question. Sure. Let, let's assume that the student has passed uh, a number of these SOLs and these campus credits. Um, does that reduce the overall amount of time that the student spends in, in a new program? Is this 
Uh, are these being replaced with additional courses? How does that, how does that work? I'm not sure what you mean by being replaced by additional courses. If I understand correctly, you say in order to graduate, you have to have ABC. Right. But if you already have uh, ABC because you've taken the SOL, so you've already done the algebra one, say right now in eighth grade, that you're not going to redo it, right? So uh, it, it, that that leaves a space, a gap. Is that going to be filled by something else, or? Well, the student is really never done taking classes until they graduate, so there's always another opportunity for another class. If I'm understanding your question, yeah, maybe you guys can help. Many of our students, let's say with math, they, they fulfill the requirements of the state well before they're finished high school. But they continue on, and yes, they don't take an IB math course or AP calculus or something. So they'll continue on with studying math. They, they've just said that maybe by sophomore year, they might have satisfied the requirements requirements of the state, but they'll continue to study. I understand. Okay. I think some of your questions will be answered too moved over on the other side, the advanced diploma, which takes the heat index up a little bit, and a lot of students aim for that. So if you will flip your paper over, we're going to take a look at the advanced studies <coughs> diploma, which is a little bit more rigorous. It requires a little bit more coursework than the standard diploma. Remember, the standard diploma required at least 22 credits and six verified. This requires 26 credits and nine verified credits. So it ups the ante a little bit. Yes. I would never say better admissions college. And I'll just say this, you'll probably hear me say this for the next five years, four years, is that college is wonderful and there's a place for everyone and there's a right school for everyone. So if you get a standard diploma and, and the schools that you're gonna to go to look at standard diplomas and your student fits into that school and that's what they wanna major in and where they have it and their ability levels are such, that's the greatest school for that student. If you get an advanced studies diploma and you're looking at certain schools, and it really is not the diploma, it's what's the right fit for your child in school and how prepared are they for school. How prepared can they be for college? I, that's the best way to look at it. We can never tell you that what schools will look at a student with a standard diploma and what won't, because there are other factors that come, come into play with uh, college admissions. We've had students who do a full ID diploma and get a standard diploma. It happens. So it's, there are just many factors that come into play. But they do know that you, the student is taking more courses if they're doing an advanced. A quick question, is this, is this also called the IB diploma or no. is that something the different? The IB diploma is completely different than the two Virginia diplomas. The okay. two Virginia diplomas are standard and advanced and the student is required to get a standard or an advanced diploma to graduate in the state of Virginia. The IB diploma is wonderful, but it's the icing on the cake and we work together. So if the student wants to pursue the IB diploma, they work towards the Virginia diploma, and then we help them with the IB diploma as well. Okay, so let's take a look at the advanced diploma. Still four years of English, and I should point out, I did say that each square is a semester. George Mason runs on a semester basis, so a student gets a half a credit for each semester that they're in, and I'll show you that on the transcript when we get there. In social studies, remember they only needed three social studies for a standard, here they need four. So if they're taking World Civ 1 in 8th grade again, they get one credit here. They could take World Civ 2 next year. If they choose not to do World Civ 2 next year and do something else in its place, they could do government in 10th grade, U.S. history in 11th grade, and then we have a follow-up course called Modern World History that they could do in 12th grade if they're not doing the IB diploma. Math, remember, that required three, now will require four for an advanced studies diploma. Science had three, now we're at four for science. And in science, we only needed two out of three disciplines. Now we, we need, I'm sorry, two out of four disciplines. Now we need three. Foreign language is required for an advanced diploma. That's one of the huge differences other than additional courses. So a student must have at least two years of two different languages or three years of the same language. And let me say again, these are all minimum requirements. So to answer your question again about are they done, these are minimum. Many of our students go beyond this. 
effortless if you just scroll up a little bit. Thanks. So they are still required to have health and PE. And then this changes a little bit. They're required to have at least one fine art or career in tech ed. And then here they need three electives and the virtual course. But again, the virtual course can be satisfied by the economics and personal finance, which is required, or another hybrid course that we offer. And then the verified credits change. They're still going to need writing and reading in 11th grade for English. But now they need two social studies, two math, two science, and one of their choice. So it really does up the ante quite a bit for the band studies diploma. Any questions? Yes. What's FLE? Is that foreign language equivalent or something? Uh, FLE, we're It's up there with health. Family life. Family. Oh, family life education. Thank you. Sorry. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I thought I heard you say uh, if you go for, if you're Chicago for an IB diploma, you were also getting a standard diploma, or you meet those requirements first or along the way? What I was saying, what the majority of our students who get an IB diploma get an advanced studies diploma. But there are situations and have been situations, and will be situations, where a student may transfer into us in high school and cannot meet all the state requirements and they want to pursue the IB diploma, they can't get an advanced <coughs> diploma. Sometimes they will get a standard diploma. But, go ahead. So I guess what my question really is, is going, taking IB classes, is there overlap with the advanced? Yes, yes. So that if you're taking IB courses, you're also at the same time getting credit for Absolutely. the advanced diploma. And let me give you an example. In, in case at the last minute, you, you don't get the IB, you don't fulfill all the requirements of the IB, you, you, you would still likely get So you brought up two great points there. Melissa, can you go to the top, to the top of this thing? So if a student is pursuing the IB diploma, this course, U.S. History, is required for an advanced diploma. We have an IB course called IB History of the Americas. They could be pursuing the IB diploma, take that as one of their social studies courses, and that also satisfies our U.S. history course. So there are multiple situations where it doubles up and counts for both. Um, and then you asked another question. Oh, the other one that, I, that you brought up, which is a good question. Um, we, we do tell our students to try and go for the advanced diploma, and if it doesn't work, they can fall back on the standard diploma. It's quite difficult once they start and think they're only getting the standard, and I say only, I shouldn't say only. They, they're getting the standard diploma, but then they realize when they're a junior, they want the advanced diploma, but they haven't taken any world language. Then they really can't get the advanced diploma. So if their mindset is they're gonna get the advanced and it's not working, they have something to fall back on. But the other thing that I'll point out is in science, for the advanced diploma, they require three disciplines. If a student is pursuing an IB diploma, the, the state says, if you're pursuing an IB diploma and you take biology in ninth grade and chemistry in 10th grade, and because you have a huge passion for biology, you want to study more in depth, you want to have your higher level, I know for some it may be confusing that I said that, but if you were here, You'll understand. Um, if you're pursuing biology in the higher level, that would mean you would take bio HL1 your junior year and bio HL2 your senior year. And that's only two different disciplines, biology and chemistry across the four years. The state will waive the three discipline requirement if you're an IB diploma candidate. So we have had students who were IB diploma candidates and then their senior year, they decided it's just not going to work for me. But now they're in the senior year and only have two disciplines. So we have to be creative. And we do have hybrid courses. And I have a student now who just did this. So now this student had to drop a class. And she's picking up another science through our hybrid learning so that because she wants to stay with the advanced diploma. So there are ways to work around it, but just to give you an idea of things ahead. Is the program of study, does it, is there a matrix or something that maps equivalency between diploma, courses, 
Um, the a la carte IB courses, the state requirements? It's all in the program okay. steps, absolutely. And when we meet next week, I'm going to go over specific courses and go over all that with you. And then I should also share with you, in the fall, every year we have something called a round robin night, where we have multiple presenters. And you go to each room for about 15 minutes, for about 15 minutes. And there are different topics being discussed. So some of them is going over transcripts, some of them is going over coursework, some of them is going over stress, <coughs> athletics, just a bunch of different things. So you'll continue to get information as we go on. And your student's counselor is a great asset to your students and to you <coughs> with any questions. Okay, any more questions on this part? Okay. It, it's good for people to know that part of PE as a sophomore year is the class portion of driver's ed. It's included as a PE. Right? It isn't still. It's, it or it is. has been. It so. has been. It, it is. And I have never been told it won't be. And it, it generally is, or it has been, the first quarter of their sophomore year. So, so it's just the class part, not the driving part. The driving part, you're on your own. <laughs> Good luck. I remember being there. Okay. Well, let, now we're going to go. These, are, I apologize, they're not. Sorry, you mentioned there's nine verified credits for the exam. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Did, 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 did I leave anything else out there? Okay. I apologize, this is not the prettiest to show you, but um, it's the best I can do. So I actually have different scenarios of what a George Mason High School transcript will look like. This transcript happens to be for a non-IB diploma student. On all the transcripts, everything that's at the top is on each. Better? If I stand here on your way, you can't see. You want to move over here? We'll put it in front of center. Okay. So everything that's at the top is on everybody's transcript. It has the student's name, birthday, gender, what grade they're in. Class of means when they're graduating. Their, their own student ID, then there's a state identification number, the home phone, address, city, all that information. And then uh, our school, our address, and our phone number. And then over here, it talks about the day the student entered at George Mason, what type of diploma they're pursuing. I can't see everything. This is more state identification. It will, when they graduate, it'll have the graduation date on it. Um, the counselor's name, our school number, and our division number. That's all standard. What's not completely standard is what the students take. So this student in eighth grade actually took courses at George Mason High School, and this is the school year. It shows the course number, the title, the grade the student achieved, and how many credits. Notice, this is for semester one. Remember, each credit, or each square that you have there is a half a credit. A half a year is a half a credit. And if Half a year is made up of two quarters. Will it show then um, on, the, on their transcript the classes they're taking here? It'll show up on the transcript the school basic high school? No. It'll show up. MEH, yes. This student, uh, eighth more grade more used to be in, in at George Mason High School. So that's why It'll that's actually there. Show up middle school for last year. It will just say Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School, yes. And then here, it shows credits <coughs> attempted. The student attempted a half a credit. Completed, the student got a half a credit. And then it does the GPA, or the grade point average, for that semester. So the transcript breaks down how the student did each semester. And this, ha this happens to be the second semester. And at the end of the transcript, it shows the cumulative GPA, which means it takes the grade point average from the entire history of high school credit, and it computes the cumulative grade point average. That is what colleges look at as part of their package. They're generally not looking at individual semester grade point average. 
I'm going to come over here for a second because I'm having a hard time seeing it. But the total credits attempted from all the courses, and this student earned 18 and a half credits out of the 21 and a half that they attempted because this student didn't pass it. And then this shows the absences. Any questions so far on this? It lists the total verified credits, so that means he didn't pass any SOLs either? At that point, no. But I also have to say, um, I'm not 100% certain that our system is listing the verified credits on the transcript. I'm not 100% certain it's doing that. It needs to be doing that, but I'm not well, sure. We, that we keep track of that. Um, so. For the it, purpose of colleges, though, okay. they, The colleges don't care about verified credits. <laughs> I would not understand no SOL results for the colleges. Right, right. They really don't care about that, but for the state, they do. But we have we we do keep uh, track of that, and Brad as well. Um, you have those sheets in front of you, and we went over those credit check sheets, the advanced and the standard diploma. Brad has created something in PowerSchool, which also tracks it in PowerSchool for us electronically. So what courses they've completed and what they still need to take. I brought this for you today because it's a visual for you to have. I thought it would be easy for you to follow with a visual. I still use the paper. <coughs> Um, it, down here it shows work in progress, so at the end of the student's junior year, this is, these are the courses <coughs> the student has signed up for at the end of his junior year. Notice this student is taking English 12 and English 11 his senior year. I say he, I don't know if it's a he or she, but um, both because did not pass it in 11th grade, so he's retaking it. On the bottom it shows um, our grades, what our what our grades are, an A with that equals, a D with that equals. Um, I'll, I'll explain what this is on the next slide, or the next. I have it. It's, it's on one of them, but if I, forget, I know it's on one of them. Okay, this is a student who started at George Mason, withdrew from George Mason, and went to an international school, and then returned to George Mason. And I just want to share this with you in case any of you move in and out. I want you to see what a George Mason transcript would look like in that regard. So this is all the same over here. This student took courses at George Mason, then left, and went to this international school. And we list the name of the international school, and at the end, which we'll show you later, it gives the name of the international school and the address. So if a college wants to contact them, they have all the information right on the transfer. When, when a student comes back to us, we list the specific courses that they took at their international school. And we take the grades and the credits that that school awards the student. We don't, we're not awarding these grades and these credits. It's been given to us on a transcript from that school, and we then take that and put it on our transcript. So we don't give credit from another place, but we accept credit from an accredited institution. Um, remember I was talking about hybrid courses? This student actually took government in a hybrid setting. This student looks, this student is definitely an IB diploma candidate. You can tell by all the IB courses plus the TOK. And again, the cumulative credits earned or cumulative GPA. This student attempted 26 and a half credits and earned 26 and a half credits. What you see down here are the SAT scores. So this student now has taken SATs and we put the SAT scores on the student's transcript. You as a parent have an op opportunity if you don't want your student's SAT, and I should say, and or ACT scores on the transcript, to let us know and we won't have them on the transcript. But the way that you have to do that is you have to send an email to Mr. Bird, our principal, requesting that they not be on the transcript and then we take them off. And the reason why you have to do that is the state says if you've taken an SAT or ACT, you have to have it on the transcript. But they'll allow us to take it off if you send a letter or an email to the principal requesting them. And you can't pick and choose which ones you want to keep on or off them. 
it's either they're on or they're off, <laughs> one or the other. And then this is the address from the international school. The other thing I wanted to point out on this one is, notice this is an IB course. Here's the letter grade, and it says IB. On a student's transcript, we show if a course is an IB course, an AP course, or an honors. Oh, here, honors. The, the, the only things that we actually show to show whether it's uh, an advanced level course or not. We weigh our IB and our AP courses. We do not weigh our honors courses. Weighing means we add extra quality points. Yeah, and just something, if it, like, like in this student's case, they transferred to another school and then came back. When a student is at another school, um, they may weight grades differently than we do, but when a student comes with grades from another, another school, we apply the weight that, that George Mason High School would apply. So some schools give weight to honors courses, we don't. So we would take that weight, not necessarily away, we would just apply the, whatever weight our grades uh, system uh, reflects. So we, we would only weight a student transfer if they took an AP or, or IB course from another school. Any other questions so far? Yes. This whole format of transcript that you have here, is this a George Mason thing, or is this a, a, a Virginia State? The way that all the schools in the state do it, or is there any sort of standardization? Uh, the state does have standardizations. Um, this is a George Mason Falls Church City transcript. Um, that's why the <coughs> SAT scores have to be on there. It's a state requirement. It's not a state requirement how it's set up as much as the information that's given on the transcript. The state does have regulations on that, absolutely. I mean, I would say that looks very similar to most, most of the, the transcripts that we receive from other schools. The difference might be like, you know, in Fairfax, they don't have a semester system for grading, they do it by year. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be one of the big differences. And then down here, this just tells someone who's reading the transcript, what IB means, what AP means, and honors, and so on. Okay, this is a student, an IB certificate student, which we now call IB course student. The title's just keep changing. Keep everybody on their toes. This student is receiving an advanced studies diploma. And again, all the courses are listed. What did I, what did I circle this? Oh, I wanted to point out that we have some courses that actually don't get a grade. So if a student wants to be a student <coughs> aid, helping a teacher during a class period where they don't have an academic or an elective class, they can be a student aid, and they want that to be on their transcript for whatever reason. They, perhaps they're helping an English teacher during their study hall time. They would like colleges to know that they really were doing something, helping a teacher in a field that they're interested in. But they don't get a grade, they get an N. An N means, um, no grade attempted. So it does have, it has zero effect on the credits, potential credits earned or the credits earned. It has no effect on the grade point average whatsoever. This is for, stu this student actually withdrew from a course. This student was an IB math SL and withdrew from the course. It was an IB course. The student didn't receive any credit it does not have any effect on the grade point average, but it appears on the transcript. I'm going to try and remember how to say when they get a W. <laughs> you might have to help me on this one. So if a student is in a class, and I remember I said every semester is made up of two quarters. <clears throat> if a student is in the first it, within the last seven weeks of the semester, if they withdraw, then the W will appear on the transcript. If it is before that, it's totally expunged from the transcript. It doesn't appear on the transcript. Do I have my dates right? Okay. We just had a long discussion about this. That's why I, so we've been going around and around with numbers. But this student had been in there long enough that the W does appear. But again, it has no effect on the grade point average. This student, this, this student's work in progress shows five courses. One, two, three, four, five. 
This student was also in a study hall, but study hall does not appear on a transcript. It doesn't show up on a transcript. Any questions on this one? What is a study hall? Sorry. Some of us are not from the U.S. And okay. So a lot of stuff here. Okay. Yeah. Study hall means they're not assigned to an academic class. English, math, science, social studies, or collective, foreign language, PE. They're not assigned to that. They're assigned to a classroom that's called a supervised study hall, which means they could go and work on their homework. They could study. Generally, our, our ninth and 10th graders are not in a study hall. They really don't have any time in their day to be in a study hall. They, we don't think that they would probably use it very effectively. Um, we feel that way about our juniors, too, <laughs> and many of our seniors. But a student is required in the state of Virginia to be considered a full-time student to be enrolled in at least five classes, a minimum of five. We have, I'm going to say, seven classes in a day, but we also offer contract choir and contract band, which is before school, so really eight. And then we have hybrid courses that a student, if they choose to, can work on their own so it can go up even higher. But they have to be enrolled in at least five classes to be a full-time student. I think this is the last one. This is a transcript of an IB diploma candidate also pursuing the advanced studies diploma. Remember, they have to get a standard or an advanced diploma to be a graduate, considered a graduate in the state of Virginia. And you'll notice this student has taken a lot of IB courses their junior and senior year. On the bottom, we don't handwrite this, we type this in now. <laughs> if they're an IB diploma candidate, we send this on their transcript so colleges know that they're an IB diploma candidate. A candidate, that means they're pursuing the IB diploma, but they don't find out if they receive the IB diploma till the beginning of July after they graduate. So we send this as an IB diploma candidate. And colleges know that the results of the IB scores do not come out until after they've been accepted to college. But this lets them know. I noticed this student only is at 25.5 and they have to have 26 for advanced. Are they going to get an advanced? We don't know. Oh. We don't know. I don't know what the end result of this student was. Oh, oh that was 11th grade. Yeah. No. Oh, oh, this, okay. okay, so that's actually a really good point. So at the end of 11th grade, this student already had 25 and a half credits. So remember I said 20, 26 for the advanced at a minimum. This student is going to go way above 26. Any other questions? Could you explain how the quality points yeah. are calculated? In sure. Here? So um, an A is worth four points, a B is worth three points, a C is okay. worth two points, a D is worth one point, and an F is not worth any points. Pluses and minuses. So pluses and minuses don't, don't count. count. Either way. If you have an A plus, it's the same as an A, as far as quality points go. GPA points go. Same thing. A minus is the same. Same thing. However, if you have an IB course and or an AP course, the quality points go up. So if you're taking AP government and you have an A in the class, it would normally be worth four points, but in this case, because it's an AP course, it would be worth five points. So you add one more on for each year for each grade level or each grade. So if you have a B in a, in a class, a regular class, it's worth three points. If you're in an IB course and you get a B, it's worth four points. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Nancy, can you make a video calendar? I was just thinking, uh, some of our students, uh, they really want to make a 4.0 or 3.5 or whatever, and they look at their eighth grade courses or some of them, they go, I took World Civ 1 and I got a C that first semester. What can I do about that? Well, they work with the counselor, they look at what they need, and there are some situations where students really don't need that World Civ one because they did World Civ two, they did IB World History, and so uh, that will be in the program of studies, how parents can request a particular grade, course and grade, to be expunged from uh, a seventh and eighth grade course. So that's um, food for thought. <laughs> <laughs>
it used to be that you had up until the beginning of the 10th grade year to request that to be expunged. That's not the case any longer. You have until the student graduates. Before they graduate. <laughs> but we would caution you, uh, I would caution you to talk to the counselor before making that decision only because we also want to make sure the student has all the verified credits they need. If we expunge it, it's no longer a verified credit. And so we want to make sure that we're double checking everything. And then then you would just send a letter to Mr. Bird again and then we could expunge it. Once it's off, it's off. It's, okay. It doesn't come back. <laughs> yes. Just related to that, if a student repeats their language that they took eighth grade mm -hmm. for credit, mm -hmm repeats it in ninth grade, didn't necessarily get a horrible grade, but doesn't feel prepared to take that big jump to the mm -hmm. third level. Do both of those appear on the transcript, or do you have to expunge the original one, even if the grade was So okay. that, that I'm question just curious is, whether they both appear on the That question is twofold. Okay. First of all, you can only get one, your, your credit mm -hmm. that you earn in a course can only go towards one course. It can't go to, right to two courses that are the same course. Yeah. With that being said, if it was an example being Spanish one and in eighth grade, wanting to go to Spanish two in ninth grade, but then realize they're not ready to go to Spanish two, want to repeat Spanish one, you could, as a parent, have the choice of having Spanish one in eighth grade appear on the transcript with the grade the student got, and then when the student repeats it in ninth grade, if that is a higher grade, that one will appear and the credit will go with that one or you can request it be expunged from eighth grade Great. completely. So the sixth grade grades don't appear, it just starts at seventh grade? Whatever is high, for high school credit. So I do oh, know it's that only we, for high school yeah. credit. Only for oh, high school okay. credit. Okay. Whatever your students took in middle school, <laughs> don't, don't panic yet. Whatever your students took in middle school, do not appear on the transcript unless it was for high school credit. So World Civ one or a language basically, or and I or apologize, algebra. or algebra and geometry. <laughs> Going back to that question of uh, if a student repeats a course, so let's say a student failed a, a course in high school and then had to retake that course to get the credit, the, the F would still appear, you can't make the F go away, even if the next time the student took the course they got a C. Yes, the C is going to be where the student got the credit, but the F still appears on the transcript even if they retook the course. We can only expunge middle school grades, not high school. No. Middle school grades, even if it was a high, for a high school credit, but not once they're in high school. Is there a timing on when that has to be requested to get rid of the middle school grade if they? Before they graduate. But I would also caution you that a lot of our students apply for scholarships throughout high school doing different things. And they request transcripts. So if, if a transcript is going to go, you want to make sure it's how you want it to go. So again, having this conversation with your student's counselor, I think, is very justified. And we can only expunge MEH grades, right? We can't expunge if your student took seventh grade algebra at another school. Am I correct? We can't expunge that grade. I've never been asked that. That's what it was. We're talking about MEH grades. It doesn't, our program of study says middle school, though. It doesn't say yeah. MEH. Okay. I could clarify that, but, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Is there a point when you put in class rank percentages and things like that? So George Mason High School does not rank its students. Uh, we do do deciles, which is a little different than ranking. So if a student has the highest grade point average in the class, if you write in your school, you would say that's number one. We do it by decile, so you never know who's number one, but we do know who's in the top part and who's not the top part. So we have to we have to give that information on the common app. But well, it's never reported on the transcript. Never on the no. transcript. Never. And when students apply to colleges, if they ask for class rank, we just say we do not rank. Has that been a problem before with college? Yeah, no. but I can also share with you that we produce something called the school profile that gets updated every summer and fall, and the information that's on the school profile is based on that past year's graduating class. So we'll list 
the George Mason High School uh, average SAT score in critical reading, writing, math. We'll list the state <coughs> information for the SAT and the national information for the SAT. We list um, how many seniors we had, what percentage of them got the advanced diploma, what percentage got the standard diploma, what percentage are, are pursuing a four-year university, a two-year. There's a lot of information on there. <coughs> and some of the things I think we were sort of going with with that is on our school profile. It does say we do not rank. It does talk about how we grade. So that is on our website if you'd like to take a look at that. And again, that's this year's school profile based on last year's graduate. Okay, so Wednesday night, um, we're going to be at George Mason High School at 7 o'clock in the cafeteria, and I hope you can all come. Um, that night, we're going to go over all the courses that ninth graders can take, what is required of them in a school day as far as coursework goes, um, and then how, they'll gonna, how they're going to go about registering for classes for next year. We do it online. Uh, how many of you have older siblings? Okay. So for those of you who have older siblings, you know how the online process works. Um, Alyssa will be working with the eighth graders in science starting in the beginning of February. February 6th and 9th. 6th and 9th in science classes, working with the students, helping them, and then they'll, I'll tell you next week when they have to have it in, but uh, we're thinking somewhere around the 18th of February have it completed. Sorry. Their course choices for next year, because then we start building our master schedule for next year, and it's based on the number of requests for courses. And we have to be working with students individually or in groups. We do we do group settings. Um, we go through science classes to go over um, kind of key points that they need to know, and certainly if you have questions, they make appointments. Um, I'll be available during some flex days for kids to come through, and I can help them schedule and those things that will happen. So. We're also going to have the uh, Mustang Ambassadors come over and meet with the eighth graders to kind of give them the, the eighth graders sort of a student perspective on this process and sort of just a transition. Uh, and I, you know, I know that this is um, can be overwhelming, especially if it's the first time you're going through this with your students. But please know, between the counselors at the middle school and the counselors at the high school and the administration in both schools, we're here to support all of you. And so we'll take you step by step <laughs> along the way. And let me share with you, your kids are going to be fine. I promise you that. Your kids are going to be fine. It's the parents that get a little worried and nervous. But I've gone through it with my own kids, and uh, I know some of the parents here have gone through it, and hopefully they've had a good experience as well. <coughs> yes? I'm looking at the side between a, a, a regular class or an honors class, and there's not a difference in the GPA. Um, and I know which way my son is going to want to air, but <laughs> is that, does that give them an advantage in going into IB or AP classes? Or you know, what, Can we hold that to Wednesday night? And okay. the reason, the reason I'm, so I'm going to say that is I've asked um, members from the different departments to come on Wednesday night. So if there are questions about should I take honors bio or bio, should I take honors English or regular English, they'll be there to answer those questions. But to further answer your question, again, if you start high, you can fall back. If you start lower, it's hard to catch up. And not everybody should start up here. They really shouldn't. They've got to start where it's right for their ability level so they can be successful. That's our ultimate goal. We want them to be uh, lovers of learning and enjoy coming to school and obviously getting the most out of it that they can and opening as many doors as they can. But there's a right college for everybody and there's a right level for everybody. So if we could hold off on that till we <coughs> stay. I do know the science department won't be there, so I'll come with it. Anything else? Yes. Um, at the end of last year, when um, my son was finishing a couple of his classes, they asked him what he felt he could do the next year. Um, and in one particular class, um, he felt like he could do the higher course, and the teacher felt like he couldn't. And so um, they put him in not a lower course, but, you know, a, a different track in that class. And he's 
he's found the class that he's in to be pretty easy overall. So I guess my question is, at the end of this year, how much input do the teachers have that they have now um, as far as uh, their trajectory in high school moving on? And do we have any say about that? Because now we're sort of, you know, in this class, and we're talking about putting him in something during the summer just to give him the, the bulk that he kind of should have been getting this year. It's a good question. I I can't speak for the middle school, and I don't know where Alyssa just left. She left at a perfect time. But, <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak for Alyssa. But um, parents always have input, and I believe parents should have input. Um, if you think your child's not in the appropriate class, then I think as a parent, you should speak up. At the high school, we will move the student if they're not being successful, obviously with consent from the student and the parent, and we will have discussed it with the current teacher. We will move the student because, again, we want them to be successful, and as I said, achieving as much as they can, but being successful while they're doing it. Um, just because your child's in whatever Oh, you came back. Good, good, good time to leave. So if the student is registering for classes next year, yes. what kind of input can the parents have As for levels of courses? Um, I mean, I think you're working together with that student. I think sometimes we, we've got a couple areas where teachers are asked to sign off just so that they can have some conversations. But it's ultimately a conversation between you and your child as to where they're headed. The only thing would be, it's a math course, they need to go in consecutive, you know, some things have to go in consecutive order for the things bubbling. Go ahead. Well, I can tell you that I, How are you? <laughs> I can tell you on the sign off that we had last year, it went kind of like this. This is what I'd like to do. And she said, absolutely not. And that was that. There was no discussion with us. Okay. And, you know, we were sort of, I think we, you know, we, we were from the Midwest, and that's not an excuse, but things are kind of people interact a little differently with their teachers and counselors there, it's just a different feel. Um, so our feeling at that point was that, okay, maybe he's just not good with this and you know we're gonna kind of follow that that lead. But we did feel like it was kind of there was no you know, there was no real explanation. It was just hey. But you as a parent and you still have your parents sign it, right? Yes. So yes. as parents, if if you disagree what's on that sheet, then I don't think you should sign it until you figure out what's going on. I really, I, that's just my personal okay, opinion. Okay. As a parent, you have that right. Maybe I just if didn't I, If I may too, uh, the teachers make a recommendation and they have a lot of data and experience and, and use their, what they've collected throughout the year to recommend various courses. And, but we, we uh, recommend, we have an open enrollment. So if there's uh, students, parents would like to enroll for a certain course, as long as it follows the trajectory, for example, you couldn't skip over, you know, English 10 and go into English 11. But, but we do we, we encourage students to challenge themselves and to take a course that that can, can be challenging. But again, teachers do have a wealth of information um, and experience over the course of the year, and often do have a great insight about where a student can be most successful, um, where a student might have uh, the, the the greatest opportunity to to be successful. So. I would say definitely check, you know, encourage a challenge, but take take the recommendations that teachers make. Um, you know, that's that's an important piece of data as you have those conversations. I think we always encourage to challenge, not overwhelm. And so I think that just keeping that piece in mind. If you know that your um, your child has decided they don't want to do an honors in one area, but want to try and push in another area, that's perfect. But that's great. See see what you know. See what happens. Certainly. But maybe it was in the it's also a seventh grade child who's much different than an eighth grade child too. I mean, there's, right. there's there's been a whole year of growth and maturity, other things as well. Well, I mean, this so. is good to know because my feeling was he brought the sheet home, he wanted to do something, we signed it, sent it back, and then she was like, "No way, not going to never." I think quote, "Never going to happen." And so <laughs> we thought that that was the end. That was no, the decision maker. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's so just for us on our end is just to try to open up some communications of you know. Um, Maybe looking at ways they can improve over the summer. You're just trying to get them so they're in a good fit to challenge, but not overwhelm when they're going into what could be a more difficult year. Are the eighth, yeah, oh. are the eighth graders um, able to take summer high school classes? 
I've been having this conversation with parents, I'll tell you what I've been saying and then kind of um, give it to uh, Ms. Perjanowitz, that it's hard to get an entire high school credit over the course of summertime without doing a lot of work. So if you're going for a new credit, it's, it's going to be a pretty big commitment. So, uh, you know, I think that's what I've been telling. I know the high school, they didn't do a lot of half credits over summertime and not the full credits. Right. Um, it's, so half credit would be better. But, well, but then you're coming in halfway through starting, and where is that going to fall to? So it depends on your kind of situation. I don't know if you have more. No, I agree with you. Um, even our high school students, we say, you know, plan on getting a half a credit if it's a new course that you're taking versus a full credit. It's, you know, these are, these hybrid courses, you're working at your own pace, and unless you're very motivated to get it done and really are working at it, it's difficult to get a full credit in that short period of time. So are all those high school classes that are on um, the summer school, are they all hybrid? Classes? They have been. Last summer they were. I haven't been told that it'll be any different. And is the list out? Did you say the list is out or not it's out? It's in our program of studies book. Okay, for what's going to be this for summer? For summer school? Or no, just for it just lists the high C courses because they could take a high C course that's listed there over the summer. But any of those could be taken over the summer? Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? But again, yeah, I was kind of hoping there were some non non computer courses, you know. I know in my nephew's school in Ohio, they have PE, and it's essentially summer camp PE for four weeks, and it's really fun, and they get their PE requirement done. But they also have a lot of you know, teachers actually teaching the courses in the summer. It's a bigger high school, have, but yeah. We do yeah. have um, PE, the activity part, which is our hybrid part, but it's not online. They're actually doing activities. Mm -hmm. and they do that. What? That's what you want. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I would recommend they take look for that P class. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, can you just talk? This is our first year. I wasn't sure about the process when you said you get a you get a list of courses so the teachers are involved. In so I'm going to. I really. I promise you. I'm going to explain. <laughs> oh, okay. This okay. is my okay. whole spiel for Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. This might be silly up here, but so summer school here is like an option. You can. I mean, it's something you can just choose to do if you yeah. want to do. It's not something that, you know, is required. you're required to do because you, you need that, you know, backup. You may be, a student may be highly encouraged, but I don't know how we could mandate that a student. No, I mean, like a student who's doing well, a, you know, an overachiever, maybe. Who we really don't have many rising ninth graders. So yeah, that's what my second question would be. If that's the case, like what percentage of your student body in, in high school chooses to take summer school when they don't really need the summer school option? Do you have a large percentage? Very small. Very small. Yeah, okay. Very small. <laughs> yeah but, but what that would you We did. Well, I was, I was going to say, we, we had a few eighth graders who were going into high school who felt that maybe they wanted to go back maybe do semester two of Algebra one, they felt they wanted to get a little bit more. So we had some do some things like that. I don't know, I don't think we had any that did a full course. It's an SOL summer. review. You know, they right. maybe right. did right. the Algebra SOL or the right. World Civil War SOL yes. and they, they worked on that and we could it. So like some enrichment. Mm -hmm. or, or just maybe not feeling like you got a little bit of a hand on things and you want to bump up a little bit before you went into that. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.